I'm here today with Patrick Henry. Patrick was professor of religion at Swarthmore College from 1967 to 1984 and executive director of the Collegeville Institute for Ecumenical and Cultural Research from 1984 to 2004. In retirement, he's a monthly columnist for the St. Cloud Times in Minnesota, where he writes about the renewal of human community. Patrick has two new books that we're going to discuss today. The first is Flashes of Grace, 33 Encounters with God, and the second is Benedictine Options, Learning to Live from the Sons and Daughters of St. Benedict and St. Scholastica. His other books include The Ironic Christian's Companion, Finding the Marks of God's Grace in the World, and you can learn more about all of his work at www.ironicchristian.org. So, Patrick, thanks so much for joining us, and congratulations on all of your wonderful work. Thank you. So, um, before we get into the books, maybe you could tell us just a little bit more about your background and, you know, some of the things that you got to do. Well, I, um, I've, I've said that I had an extraordinarily a privileged background. I was a white Protestant American male uh, with a, an excellent education brought up in the Candu, Texas of the Eisenhower 1950s. So I had, the, my agenda was set, I knew the agenda of the world, and I was on top of everything. So part of my uh, life journey has been learning to give up some of that privilege, or at least acknowledge it, and to try to turn it to something good rather than uh, simply uh, turn it to my advantage. Uh, I grew up in Texas, but have been away from there since uh, I went away to college. Uh, I've had um, an extraordinarily privileged education. I, uh, Harvard, Oxford, and Yale, uh, wow. it'd be hard to, uh, so I, I should know something. <laughs> and, uh, and I've often, thought that uh, that kind of privilege uh, puts on me a great obligation to try to give back and to um, be of use. So I, I'll leave it at that now. Uh, but uh, as you, uh, you mentioned, the jobs that I've had, uh, they were two of the best jobs anybody could have. At Swarthmore, my students made me smarter every day. And at the Collegeville Institute, I got to know and work with extraordinary scholars from all over the world who were really concerned not just to contribute to their fields, but to help those fields contribute to the welfare of the world. Uh, so I have been lucky beyond, uh, beyond anybody's uh, right to claim. Well, I can totally relate with a lot of things that you just said and I feel very similarly about my own, you know, kind of journey and obligation to uh, be a good steward, you know, of what um, privilege and what gifts I've been given. So uh, I relate quite heavily to that and I'm so glad that you're doing what you're doing. Thank you. Um, so before we talk about the new books, tell us about, you know, the previous, I, I mentioned one that you've written. Um, tell, can you tell us about that and, and others? The Ironic Christian's Companion, which was published in 1999, uh, is a, maybe is a prequel to Flashes of Grace, or Flashes of Grace is a sequel to that. Uh, once I published that, which was done by uh, Riverhead Books, I thought maybe I've said all that I have to say. But as the years progressed since then, I discovered that I had a good deal more to say on the whole question of what, of how God's grace impacts my life. I don't ever claim to know what grace is. I know how, it, how I encounter it, what it means to me. Prior to that, uh, early on in my career, I did a book called New Directions in New Testament Study, which grew out of my teaching in, the, in my Bible courses at Swarthmore. Um, and then uh, with a colleague at Swarthmore, Donald Swearer, who's one of the leading experts on Buddhism in the world, uh, I wrote, together we wrote a book called For the Sake of the World, The Spirit of Buddhist and Christian Monasticism, mm. which uh, in various ways led to my being involved in the Beth Gethsemane encounter in 1996 that brought Buddhist and Christian monastic people together in the course of that, I recommended to monastic interreligious dialogue 
that they commission some of the Buddhists to write reflections on the rule of St. Benedict. And they accepted it, and I ended up editing the book. And we ended it, it ended up being called Benedict's Dharma, Buddhists Reflect on the Rule of St. Benedict, which uh, was a kind of model of what I hope there will be more of as time goes on. That is people in one tradition reflecting on central books or texts in another tradition, uh, rather than rather than even having people come together and talk about them, to have the Buddhists reflect on the rule of Benedict rather than Buddhists and, and Benedictines talking together about it has a kind of freshness to it. So uh, those are some of the, the books that have my name on them. Very cool. I'm edited Very cool. And some well, I, don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with this one book that Barbara Brown Taylor came out with maybe a year or two ago called Holy Envy. I absolutely. I uh, she's depending on that wonderful remark of Christopher Stendhal, talking about the experience of seeing something in another tradition that you want, would love to have, but know that you really can't. You can't ever have it the way do, you do. But taking envy, which is one of the deadly sins, and turning it holy—that is one of the neatest tricks ever. <laughs> and uh, I I've read Barbara's book and and wish I'd written it. <laughs> it was a wonderful book. Yes. You know, on, on multiple levels. No, no question about that. But very much alignment with what, what you know you've done. So that's really nice to see. So um so let's talk about the, the first of the two books that I mentioned, um, Flashes of Grace, yes. 33 Encounters with God. Um first I want to ask you about the title. I mean, is the book literally about 33 different encounters with God? And were they all your encounters, or does it include experiences of others? There are 33, and they are my encounters. I was once asked, why are there 33? Thinking Somebody thinking that there must be some uh, numerological significance to that. And my answer is that I simply wrote the encounters and then added them up, and there were 33. <laughs> if I had chosen a number in advance, it would have been the uh, number 42, which Douglas Adams famously in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy said was the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. So my 33 are just 33 40 seconds of the answer to everything. <laughs> That's great. But they are all, they are all mine. They are Many of them are my encounters with the encounters of others. Hmm. Uh, so that what I, I, I put a lot of people, there are lots and lots of, of notes of, that indicate where I encountered this or that. But each of these, I'm not hiding behind them. Each of these is a conversation partner. And so these encounters are other people frequently are the agents of my encounter with God. So to that extent, it's not just mine, but every one of these is an account from me of what my engagement with somebody else meant. Wow. So did you keep a journal when these were occurring? Or how no, did no, I didn't. Some of them are recorded at greater length in things that I published articles and so on. Okay. Uh, so there are various references in the book to things that I've published before, but uh, many of them, well, some came from emails. Mm -hmm. One came from a, a, a sort of next day memo I gave to myself about a dream I'd had. One of the, 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 uh, the dream I had in which I was late to a Shakespeare exam, and I saw Shakespeare, who, or I think it was Shakespeare, who explained to me that he was not an, a, a thoroughgoing existentialist, which would say everything is invented uh, from scratch all the time, but rather each of his plays has a different context. That is, they, the world, each, each of the plays is a world, but it is a world that has its own structure 
uh, which may be different from the others. So in any case, I was ripped at, at age 82, nearly 83. I'm going through stuff. I'm a bit of a pack rat and trying to scan things that somebody sometime might want to see so that nobody has to go through reams and reams of paper. And I came across this note that I had completely forgotten. Hmm. Uh, and But there was this dream that reminded me of an encounter that was, in effect, a moment of grace uh, for me. So it's, yes, it's, it's, the encounters are mine, but they are, they are a wide variety of types of encounters. Wow. And it sounds like they took place over a period of years. Well, they took place over a lifetime, basically. Wow. Uh, beginning, I don't remember whether I refer to anything in high school, but certainly from college on. So it, it's taking me from the 1950s to the 2020s. Hmm. So tell us about Starship Enterprise and what role that played in the, in the creation of the book. Okay. To explain that, I have to set a context, and it goes back almost half a century to the era of the typewriter before word processors automatically inserted dates in letters. So I'm typing a letter, March, and I type in March 26th, 1975, but my finger slips and I hit another six. So it says March 26th, 19,756. <laughs> and I sat uh, and I didn't immediately correct it. I sat transfixed because I had suddenly catapulted myself into the 198th century. And I'm almost certain that this is what occurred to me at that moment. That is, I'm now in the 198th century, which means that those of us in the first 2,000 years of the history of the church are no greater a part of our, 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 our sorry, those of us in the first 2,000 years are to the 198th century the same as the first 200 years are to us in the 20th century. Wow. And so I thought we in the 20th century in the have as much responsibility and authority for the tradition as those in the first 200 years. Mm -hmm. Why are we so fixated on the first 200 years and said everything got settled then, and all we're doing is living off of that. So I then get uh, immersed in Star Trek The Next Generation, which of course takes us only to the 24th century rather than 198, but still it seems very remote from us. And I find myself feeling much more at home in the company of Captain Picard and his crew than I do in the company of many Christians of my own time who are very, very sure about everything. <laughs> uh, the, those who, uh, who insist that the Christians have everything figured out and everybody else is uh, in, in darkness. So I began to wonder, what is it about my experience of the 24th century that what, how can I think back to my own 20th century and see how what is characteristic of the Christian tradition now is, is compatible with the world of Captain Picard and his crew, because there is virtually no reference to Christianity at all in the Star Trek The Next Generation. The word church appears twice in the 176 episodes. One, church is put in a category with knickknacks, and in the other, they are in uh, 19th century um, San Francisco, and the uh, woman they meet says, oh, I was in a church play once, and that's it. That's the only word. Wow. But still, I felt uh, very much at home there. So uh, how, what did I learn from that? I learned that certain features of Christianity in our time need to be um, lifted up and exploited. My friend Richard Mao, who was a leading conservative evangelical president of Fuller Seminary, uh, was 
asked by a reporter, what do you make of these discoveries of the Hubble Space Telescope about how vast the universe is? Doesn't that, uh, doesn't that call into question your Christian identity? And uh, Rich simply quoted to him the, the, the hymn, How Great There Art. He said, he said uh, we Christians have no difficulty taking into account the vastness of the universe because that's the God we know. So that is part of it, the vastness. And then the, one of the most uh, compelling episodes of The Next Generation for me was one in which some of the, uh, some of the members of the crew are trans, trans, transported into another dimension, which is just a very, very tiny distance off from the dimension that the, the uh, ship is in. So those who have been, they can see their colleagues, but the others can't see them. And eventually they figure out how to make the dimensions accessible to each other. And so uh, I think that that ex explain, that clued me in that the world of the spirit and the world of matter are very, very close. And I, in the book, uh, in the other book, I do quote this wonderful uh, remark of Emily Dickinson in an 1863 letter. She said, I noticed that the supernatural was only the natural disclosed. <laughs> and that, in, there's a sense in which Star Trek The Next Generation, in a whole variety of ways, illustrated that for me. So the book, uh, this book that came out to be Flashes of Grace was at least 12 years in gestation and started out uh, as uh, Left Behind with the Da Vinci Code, which <laughs> became one of the chapters. And then it went through a long period of being remembering forwards taken from uh, Alice in Wonder or taken from Through the Looking Glass where the White Queen says to Alice, it's a poor imagination, a poor memory that only works backwards. And so I was talking about remembering forwards to the 24th century. And each chapter had a link to Star Trek The Next Generation. But then an editor said, that's a little artificial. And you got to remember, Star Trek The Next Generation ended in 1993. <laughs> and there are a whole lot of people alive today for whom that's ancient history. Right, so right. I condensed, I condensed uh, Star Trek into a chapter. Uh, but Star Trek The Next Generation served its purpose by, in a sense, planting the seed for the whole book. Wow. That's just amazing. Talk about you know, some things that cause a person to think out of the box, right? That is yeah, what I, it feels like that you were doing. <laughs> and I really, actually, on that matter, I really appreciate a recent column by Tom Friedman in which he quoted a friend of who, who said, it's not just thinking inside the box. It's not just thinking outside the box. It's thinking without a box. <laughs> and I guess I would like to think that Flashes of Grace, at least in moments, is thinking without a box. Wow. Very cool. Well, um, I'd like to read a, a re quick review of one of the books. This is from Publishers Weekly. It says, any Christian will find inspiration in this glowing testament to living a God-infused life. So can you tell us how you think that um, this instills a God-infused life for folks? I don't think it instills it. I hope it sparks it or ignites it. Um, I'm not suggesting that people have the same story I do, but I do hope that as they read these chapters, they will, they will uncover or unveil memories of their own that have the same kind of effect. I, um, I'm, uh, for me, the experience that I'm trying to, not, well, I'm trying, but, but I guess more I'm hoping than trying. I'm hoping 
to ignite is one such as I had when reading Peter Brown's uh, biography of Augustine. And I tell you, in one of the chapters, I talk about this. Um, he, he says, in effect, he says, Augustine opted for Christianity rather than all the other options that he tried. And he tried nearly everything that was available to him. All those others closed things off. The church gave him the most room to move around. That absolutely electrified me mm. and became both a, a kind of description of my sense of what the Christian tradition was for me and an aspiration for what it could continue to be and always be more. So what, what I would dream of is somebody reading my book and somewhere something leaps off the page and does for them what that sentence or two of Peter Brown's book did for me. Hmm. The other, um, the other uh, one that, uh, the other phrase that worked like that for me was um, John Keats's negative capability in a letter he wrote to his brothers um, in which he says, that it occurred to him that what Shakespeare had to the nth degree was neg negative capability, the ability to be in mysteries, uncertainties, and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. The key to that is he's not dismissing fact and reason. He just doesn't want it to be irritable. <laughs> and living in doubts, mysteries, uncertainties, for me, that is moon to, that is room to move around in, not a pit to try to, to climb out of. So uh, between John Keats and Peter Brown, I can report experiences of, of breakthrough, uh, rug pulling out, rug getting pulled out from under me, whatever metaphor you want to use. That's what I hope uh, this book might do for people. Hmm. As I say at the end, I hope that it will loosen uh, stiff spiritual joints and make allow for movement to be more spontaneous and free. That's the that's what I hope happens. Wow, wow, very cool. So let's move on to the second book now. Um, Benedictine options: learning to live from the sons and daughters of Saints Benedict and Scholastica. So how did that book come about? Uh, I don't remember when it was after it was published in 2017 that I read Rod Dreher's book, The, Bene the Benedict Option. But seldom have I been so um, annoyed by a book. Uh, seldom have I felt that a book was so wrongheaded. Uh, and that I sort of left it at that. Then as I was going through things that I have written, things, some of which are published and many of which are unpublished, uh, I began to realize that I had written a lot about Benedictinism. Uh, from the time I was first a resident scholar in Collegeville in 1975 until now, I have lived very close to Benedictines, the Benedictine men of St. John's Abbey, the Benedictine women of St. Benedict's Monastery here in Minnesota, uh, and I have, I hadn't realized how much I had reflected on what my engagement with them had meant. So I was reading these things and I began to think, lurking in here is a response to Rod Dreher. Uh, so I put some of those things together and made a proposal uh, to liturgical press where I sit on the acquisitions committee. So there's a kind of, of uh, maybe a conflict of interest here, but I withdrew from discussion of my proposal and my colleagues there did me a wonderful service. They said, what you are, what you want to say is something more positive about Benedictinism rather than a, a contradiction of Rod Dreher. So keep your your argument with Dreyer in there, but but set it aside, set it 
to on the side in a sense and make the book an account of what you have come to appreciate about Benedictinism. So the the um, as I said, uh, uh, flashes of grace took about twelve years. Benedictine options took about six months, <laughs> partly because I was revved up, partly because some of it, not all of it by any means, is based on some things that I already had already written. But I wanted to do it because I believed that Rod Dreher had hijacked <laughs> friends of mine. Hmm. That is, he, he, he had taken the tradition that friends of mine have committed their lives to and turned it into something that I believe is radically different from, even antithetical to, what my Benedictine friends are all about. So I, uh, the Benedict option, according to something I read a year ago, it sold 77,000 copies, which is means a whole lot of people have their view of Benedictinism shaped by a, a view that says what we learn from Benedict is to separate ourselves off from this cold, dead, dark world. Cold, dead, and dark are uh, Rayer's uh, phrases used over and over again in the book. And what I've, not any Benedictine that I know believes that the world is cold, dead, and dark. Uh, it is, uh, for them, Benedict was helping to understand the blessings, the light, the uh, glories in the world, rather than separating off from a world that was cold, dead, and dark. So I wanted to retrieve what I believe is the genius of the Benedict tradition from what I consider the terrible distortion of it that is in Dreyer's book. Um, so the, um, I, he had hijacked my friends. I wanted to, in a sense, uh, he had, he had, um, uh, he was taking them sort of as his hostages. I wanted to retrieve them from the hostage taking. Um, and he had, he had turned their, oh, sorry. What I really want to say is my book was originally called the Benedictine options. And at one, at some point, I suddenly realized that the definite article got it all wrong. It is not the Benedictine options. Benedictine options are always in process. There are always new ones bubbling up, sort of like virtual particles coming up out of the, out of the vacuum. Uh, you can't predict what they will be. So Benedictine options, is that the very title itself is a kind of repost to the Benedict option. Interesting, interesting. Well, it sounded like you were really driven, you know. In your I life. driven as much as I have been by anything I've ever, uh, I've ever undertaken to write. And there was a kind of intensity. It, uh, it did happen very fast. And not only because some of it was already done, but also because I I needed to I needed to speak for my friends mm -hmm. these these people that I have come to know and love through close association over nearly half a century. <laughs> so speaking of which, let me read this um, endorsement from Kathleen Norris about the book. <laughs> she says Patrick Henry, who has lived and worked among Benedictine men and women for many years, is offering us a refreshing and realistic look at the way that ancient Benedictine values are lived in the world today. At a time when so many societies are damaged by divisive ideology, naked greed, and lust for power, this book helps us to see there is another way. In these pages we find monastics, ordinary people living an extraordinary life of prayer and community, who make us realize that grounding oneself in love and hospitality is not ancient, but always new and more relevant than ever. So what would you say, you know, from studying these saints and, and the friends that you know has helped ground you in love and hospitality? 
let me let me sidle up to that. I, I think I will get to it, but I want to say that uh, for me, maybe the most um, the, mo the the essential insight that I think I have about Benedictinism is what I call the distinction between experiment and experimental. Frequently in college courses on utopias, monasticism will be part of the syllabus. Uh, it does not, monasticism does not belong in a syllabus on utopia at all, because a utopia is an experiment in which the person in charge knows what the ideal is. Hmm. That is the, uh, whether it's um, B.S. Skinner's Walden II, whether it's uh, any of the other kinds of utopias that have been tried over the years, all of which disappear pretty quickly. Each of them is grounded in a visionary's sense of what the human being should be. And I will construct a framework in which that will be developed and be fixed, almost like fixing in amber. And that is exactly what the rule of Benedict is not. So what Benedict managed to do was to write a charter for an experimental community. The abbot is to pay particular attention to the young. And most important, the abbot has to pay special attention to every individual monk's idiosyncrasies. So that, and then uh, Benedict says at the end of the rule, this is just a little rule for beginners. Mm -hmm. You get to the end of your you get to the end of your career as a Benedictine, and the most you can claim is to have made a good beginning. You cannot claim to have figured it out. You cannot claim to have lived perfectly the life you were created to live. So the whole notion of God has a plan for your life is somewhat askew from the Benedictine view. The plan is that you enter a community in which, along with others, you discover in a lifetime a little bit about how you should live. Um, and then, uh, but along with it just being a beginning, there is the uh, statement early in the rule that we run on the path of God's commandments until they become natural. And we then are, we live with the inexpressible delight of love. Inexpressible there is the key. You, you, you don't, express it in some rule. You don't have, nobody has in their head what that expression is. So I think you, you ask how this has helped me. I think it has both extra, extricated me from the notion that I have to get it all figured out and that there is some set of rules, some set of, there is some, uh, model out there of the human being that I'm supposed to be and has loosened me up then to experiment and to learn from others. I don't have to figure it out all on my own. Um, so I, I'm not sure. That I, I hope that in the book, I have explained the distinction between experiment and experimental in a way that grabs people because I do think uh, if if I if I am remembered for anything, I would like to be remembered as the person who figured out that the genius of the rule of Benedict is its being experimental rather than an experiment. And that just makes a to whole me, lot of sense. To me, that has that has been <clears throat> revolutionary. Um, evolutionary, enlightening, freeing, joy and joy engendering, all kinds of things I could say about it. So um, that there's much, much more I can say about what the uh, Benedictines have meant to me, but that uh, that's at the heart of it. 
I love that distinction between an experiment, a predefined experiment with a defined goal or, you know, state versus experimental, which is basically learning. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> learning and learning without, that is the learning with the recognition that even by the end of your life, there will still be more, there would still be more to learn. You haven't got it all figured out. Well, I mean, you know, for me, that's just logic, right? We're, yeah. we're, we're humans. We're not right. God. So yeah. how can we presuppose that we're going to figure it all out? <laughs> and, and, and some people would say, we can figure that out because God has us already told us all it's in the Bible. Not, well, in my not. study of the, in my study of the Bible, uh, you can, there is hardly any position a not a b not b that you can there's hardly anyone that you cannot support from somewhere in the bible so to me the bible is a is a marvelous it's a it is a, a handbook rather than a than a tourist guidebook uh, the uh, you know, one of the things that i that i began to think about as i was imagining our conversation is whether there's anything that ties these two books together. And I think what does tie them together is, is related to this whole notion of experimental. I don't know that there has been any moment in my life when I was so thunderstruck as I was by a moment in 1994 that I encounter that I mentioned in chapter two of the book called Perspective, in which I was in uh, I was in Milwaukee at a, a conference in uh, at Marquette, and one of the other participants in this was Henry Chadwick, Sir Henry Chadwick, uh, one of the greatest uh, church history scholars of the 20th century, who had been a teacher of mine at Oxford. Uh, he and I were the only two people from out of town who were there and we were staying in the hotel. And so I got to have dinner and breakfast with Henry Chadwick alone. And there were a whole lot of people in my uh, line of work who would have given at least one arm, if not both, <laughs> the privilege of uh, that, those two times with Chadwick. But I think it was at breakfast and I asked him, what are you working on now? And he said, Oxford University Press has been after me for years to do an updated version of the early church, which was his 1967 book that was the standard text for anybody in that field. Hmm. So, and, I, and he said, and I finally decided to respond positively to them. So I innocently and obviously asked, well, how does one do an updated version of a book that has become the standard in the field. And I assumed that he would say, I'm adding a new preface and changing one or two things, adding one or two things I've changed my mind about and maybe adding to the bibliography. But what he said, and I, I'm getting goosebumps now, again, all these years later, just remembering it. He said, I'm rereading all the sources. Hmm. Wow. And Chadwick is one of very few people who could say all and honestly mean it. <laughs> but what just what overwhelmed me, and thunderstruck is the right word, what overwhelmed me was to see this great archetypal scholar saying, here I am in my uh, eighth decade, it was in his seventies. And I'm, and I have read all this stuff and I've said what I had to say about it, but I'm going to read it all again to see what it says to me now. Basically rethink so everything. It, rethink it. Re, not just rethink, but re, re-encounter. That is, he's, he's not just saying, I, my sense is that when he read The Shepherd of Hermas or Irenaeus or Augustine, again, 
He's not saying, this is what I used to think. Has it changed? He is, he's reading it as if for the first time. Hmm. That is, he, he's, not, he's not prejudging it by what he already had already thought about it. At least that's the way I read it. And so in 19, uh, in 2001, I think it was, he published uh, his, this at age 81, he published uh, From Galilee to Gregory the Great, The Church in Ancient Society, which is a much bigger book than the first one, but it is not a revised, <laughs> the early church of 1967. It is what all the sources said to Henry Chadwick uh, in his uh, eighth going on ninth decade. And that for me is the, the uh, for the 33 encounters, I'm hoping that the, that the fresh, I'm, I'm hoping that as I wrote about those, I was saying, what do they, what do they say to me now? I'm rereading the sources of my life mm -hmm. uh, at, uh, in my eighth decade. And for, um, Benedict and options, what triggered by Rod Dreher, what do I now have to say, want to say, what do I now see about my engagement with, my friendship with, my debt to hmm. these Benedictines? What hmm. do I see that I may be had not seen before, and and I revised some of what I had, some of the material that I reuse in this. So, for me, what holds the books together is the the terror, the excitement, the exhilaration, the sense of of obligation that I had in trying to reread all the sources. Wow. Uh, given, as I said at the beginning, I've been privileged beyond just about anybody's ability to imagine and have, have uh, much of my life felt that I have a special responsibility to give back whatever I can. And now, almost 83, realizing that I hope I've got a lot yet to do, but there will an end come that uh, I need to keep doing everything I can to to give back of uh, as a kind of obligation for all these privileges I've been given. So you know, obviously, you've just published two you know amazing books, but I have to ask you, what do you think is next? <laughs> I will say at the moment. I don't know, and I don't know whether there's another book in me or not. Uh, I do, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, I have now, I'm in the, toward the end of my 15th year as a monthly columnist <laughs> for our local newspaper, uh, which that exp the, I think both of these books uh, reflect something that I've learned there. One is to be fairly brief, so the chapters in uh, Flashes of Grace are brief, the importance of trying to avoid polysyllables whenever possible, and the importance of wrapping things up at the end with something memorable. So at the end of each chapter of Flashes of Grace, there's called In a Word, and I try to summarize. Mm -hmm. I've learned that from writing a newspaper column. Uh, short paragraphs, avoid run-on sentences, mm -hmm. uh, and but the uh, in terms of in response to your question, what I have learned is that when I started this in 2007, I figured I'd probably write maybe a dozen columns and and have them in a file folder and pull them out as the months uh, progressed. And it doesn't work that way at all. Once I have finished a column, I have absolutely no idea what the next month's column is going to be. <laughs> Uh, and that's partly because the newspaper wants it to be tied to the news. Mm -hmm. But I've learned that I am thinking without, I'm thinking things through without being aware of it. And it comes time to write a column and it's already there, even though I wasn't consciously thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what I hope is there's another book 
<laughs> I, and whether I was saying that using this motion may suggest a couple of things that I'm going crazy <laughs> with the action, uh, but that I I hope there might be something more in there, but I don't know what it is. I do have, you mentioned my website, I am periodically blogging there, and I discover that many of my blogs are reflections on other books I've been reading. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, can, I can tell you right now, there is not another book uh, waiting in the computer or even in my head, or it may be waiting in my head, but I don't know it. It's certainly not in the computer yet. <laughs> wow. I would well, not have, never would I have predicted that uh, in, in uh, 2021, I would publish even one book, much less two. So <laughs> there's never no, no way to know. It's well, all good for you. <laughs> so I really uh, encourage people to consider these two books. The first one, again, is Flashes of Grace, 33 Encounters with God. And the second is Benedictine Options, Learning to Live from the Sons and Daughters of Saints Benedict and Scholastica. And you can learn about both of those as well as everything else that uh, Patrick does at ironicchristian.org. So, Patrick, thanks so much for joining us. And thank you so much for all of these contributions that you've made. Just incredibly impressive and inspiring. And thank you, Ryan. And thank you for your questions. They have themselves uh, prompted me to say things that I uh and mostly fairly glad to have said <laughs> well very good very good thanks so much thank you